Okay. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful uh, conference site, ICTS for Hospitality. I must say I'm really jealous of this beautiful amphitheater for, for our talks. And today, you know, in the spirit of, uh, of this discussion meeting, I must say that my first, my pr main objective is really not to reach the end of my talk. And for that, I need help from you. So do interrupt, ask questions, make comments. Um, if you don't agree with something, that, that's fine. I think that's uh, much easier for me, and I would thank you for, for that, and also perhaps more interesting for you. And what I'd like to talk to you about is a, a viral uh, dynamics, that is the study and the quantification, the modeling of the dynamics of virus within an infected person. And I will focus mostly, or almost exclusively, on HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, and because I think it's one of the great success stories of mathematical biology, of applying quantitative mathematical uh, notions to uh, disease uh, biology. And of course, Narendra also did a good job, so you'll see some almost exact slides. We shared an office maybe 15 years ago, and apparently we still have some some uh, ideas that are alike, but I will try to go faster over those. And the way this works, in this viral dynamics idea works, is because of a very startling observation. And this observation is that many chronic infections, and this includes HIV, as I said, but also hepatitis C virus, hepatitis B virus, and some other infections, have this peculiar, um, dynamics when the person gets infected. You have this initial transient phase of a viral load going up, this is called acute phase, to a peak and then coming down, like Narendra showed a schematic on one of his slides, and then going to what's called a kind of a set point, a quasi-steady state viral load. I mean, in principle, there would be no reason for the virus to be in this situation. And here is an example of about 40 people from Africa and Thailand infected with different HIV virus. Um, so each line, each color line here is one person, and this, this person has uh, volunteered to give blood very frequently so he could measure the viral load. And what we measure is to take blood, one milliliter of blood, how many virus particles are there. And this is measured by counting how many genomes of the virus are there by PCR, which is a molecular assay that's very quantitative and reproducible. And what you see here, this is a one year time scale, 365 days, more or less, is that you have this peak, as I mentioned, and then this is the median of all these people. You see that they really go to a very stable. This is a logarithmic scale, by the way. It goes to 10 to the 8 there. This is about 10 to the 5 here. And this is a different set of patients, um, a different type of virus strain of the virus. You still see the same thing. So at least this, this scale of one year, you see this more or less stable. But you can look at longer. Now we have 400 patients here from France and the Netherlands. That's the shaded dots. And then there's several lines, but let's just focus on this black line, which is kind of the statistical random effect model that for each of the, uh, of the patients. And you can see now we are years here. And that this, at least, you know, maybe out to five or six years, doesn't change very much. There is a slight increase, perhaps. There's a trend. But there is not a, it's not a big, uh, a big change uh, over time. So you have this uh, uh, kind of steady state. So much so that many people thought, uh, physicians, thought that there's not much going on. The virus somehow goes to there and it just stays there for some reason. But of course, if you're quantitative, if you're a more dynamical background, let's say, this immediately um, brings to mind one very, very, very simple model, which is, well, we have the virus, it's being produced, it's being cleared, there's many biological processes involved, but this could be in steady state even though there's production and there's clearance. And you have the very simple uh, equation here, we assume production is constant, clearance is a first order um, kinetic process, and P equals CV because the, the viral load is approximately constant. Okay, so this is very basic. But immediately even this basic model uh, might suggest something. And that something is, if we somehow can perturb this steady state, 
then we might be able to learn something about the dynamics of the process. For instance, if I could increase the removal of the virus, now I would see something happening, and that would tell us something about the clearance rate, so the dynamic property of the virus. And that can be done, and that was done. You basically put people on a dialysis machine that filters the blood, and when it filters the blood, means takes the virus out. When you do that, you know, you have a slightly changed version of the previous equation. We say that before you're a steady state, you assume that the dialysis is not changing the production. This is just maybe one hour, two hour uh, periods. And then you just increase the, the rate uh, of removal. And the only unknown in this equation is C. Epsilon is the rate of removal you're measuring it. P0 comes from CV0. V0 is the steady state before you do the dialysis. And so you, you can calculate C. And this is just two patients. It was not done in many patients. But this HIV, there's a lot of noise here because this is a scale of minutes now. So we've gone from minutes to to years, to many years. But there is a, a decline in the virus, and then when you stop, it comes back up, and this was systematic in all the patients. And there is not a very big decline. That already is telling you that the production in the clinic is so fast in under natural conditions that when you do this small perturbation, you don't see a major uh, effect. But we could calculate the half-life, so how long does it take to take half of the virus away? and so C is about 23 per day, which corresponds to about, you know, let's say one hour, 60 minutes half life or less than that. So that means that every 60 minutes, half of the virus that you have in your body is being removed and replenished because of the steady state for years on end. So this is a very dynamical situation. And so very simple model, but they already get a very important parameter of the dynamic of the virus. All right. And this, worked on hepatitis C, it works on hepatitis B, as I said, but now I'm going to focus on human immunodeficiency virus, which is one of the greatest pandemics that the world has ever seen. As Narendra mentioned already, there's over 70 million people have been infected, over 40 million people have died since this was recognized as a new infection back in 1981 or so. And more than the numbers, I always put this slide on my presentations on HIV, because this represents the gain in life expectancy in sub-Saharan African countries since, let's say, the end of World War II up to 1995, more or less, it was always increasing. This is, you know, new sanitation measures, vaccination campaigns, improvements in nutrition, and overall health. And then, if you look from 1990-something, the next 10 years, exclusively due to HIV and AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, all the gains were lost, and these countries, these three countries, have a high percentage of people infected. We're talking about 20 to more percent of adults uh, infected with HIV, versus these two countries, which is a much lower level of infection, and you see this enormous uh, uh, decline. And if you look at Botswana, it's a country that's stable, you know, not rich, but not, uh, you know, very, very poor, doesn't have had any political upheavals or anything. There's nothing else that explains this huge decline in HIV. So this has had an enormous impact in uh, people's lives and countries' lives. Anyway, the good news is that when the world comes together and decided that it tried to help, there was the first disease for which there was a, a special assembly of the United Nations to deal with this and to, for countries to donate money, make drugs available cheaper. There, there was an impact that could be seen. So this is a an optimistic view. Sometimes the world can come together for good things. Uh, we saw this already. The only thing I'll say, so this is the viral load in red triangles, and the virus infects cells of the immune system. In particular, so-called CD4 positive T cells. These are cells, uh, lymphocytes, that are made in the thymus, this gland we have here behind our sternum, and that they have on the surface this uh, molecule CD4 to which the virus can attach and eventually infect. And these cells are crucial in orchestrating, controlling the immune response against uh, everything, basically. And what we see is that the normal number is about 1,000 per microliter. And when we have an infection, there's this relentless decline throughout the years until when we have very low numbers, actually less than 200 by definition, you are in the state of AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency. The immune system as a whole cannot control 
many types of infections or challenges that you are faced with every day, and, and then eventually a person dies. For instance, with TB, like was mentioned yesterday, even though that could be controlled perhaps without HIV. Um, and this is without treatment, essentially. No one, it's the only infection that I know of that no one has been able to, that we don't know of any case of a person who's been infected, and the immune system or the person has been able to uh, cure him or herself uh, without any intervention. And even with intervention, okay, and this is the life cycle of the virus. The, as I said, attaches, attaches to the CD4 uh, molecule on the surface of the cell. There's other co-receptors eventually it can fuse the, the viral membrane with the cell membrane. It, the capsid of the virus goes inside, and the genome, which is an RNA molecule, is reverse transcribed into DNA. So this is the opposite of normal uh, biological processes in eukaryotes. And then this DNA integrates in the nucleus, in, in the genome of the host cell of the CD4. At this moment, this cell is basically, it has 9,800 approximately base pairs more than a normal cell, which has billions of base pair, so it's basically indistinguishable from all other cells. And that's the latent stage that Narendra mentioned, which you cannot really find these cells. But most commonly, the cell is not, doesn't stay silent once it's infected. It starts producing viral proteins, viral uh, RNA genomes, which goes onto the surface of the cell and then steals part of the cell uh, uh, membrane to make new virus. These new virus, are not fully mature and not infectious uh, right away. They have to suffer some prote uh, proteolytic cleavage of the proteins to become inf infectious. And the reason I say this is because HIV is the virus for which probably have most treatments. There's been a, a huge investment, and we know the most in, uh, of any disease probably in terms of all these intricate details. And there are drugs, specific drugs, that affect this binding here, the fusion, the reverse transcription, the integration in the cell nucleus, the maturation of the virus. So there's different classes of drugs that target uh, the viral life cycle, and these are the, what makes um, treatment so powerful and so effective. So in what happens when a person is treated? This is an example of a person. This is now days, about four months. This is 10 to the 6 virus. In, when you start a powerful treatment, in just 10 to days to two weeks, the virus comes down very quickly, about two logs or more, and then it slows down, but it continues to go down until it goes below detection. And now what we have is basically uh, another type of perturbation. Instead of increasing the clearance, we are somehow affecting production of the virus, and we could try to use the same idea. We have the same model. But because we are dealing with a specific virus, HIV, and we know the treatments, we can be a little bit more uh, descriptive, and we can use a, a second level of toy model. Now we have the target cells, the CD4 positive cells. We have the virus. Once they get infected, they become in infected cells. These infected cells produce virus, completes the cycle, and we have these ongoing cycles that are uh, going on all the time. And we have some parameters like the removal, the death rate of infected cells, the removal of the virus. Uh, target cells could also be uh, regenerated and, and left. And we're interested in analyzing this. And when we have treatment, the two initial types of treatment that were uh, available were reverse transcription inhibitors. So they prevented this, uh, this step where the RNA becomes DNA. And that would mean that the cell cannot get infected. And there was a protease inhibitor, which prevented the maturation of the virus once it comes out. So the virus comes out, but it's non-infectious. So the virus is now non-infectious. So now what we do, we have this cartoon, we write the corresponding equations, and I'm just dealing with very simple models, just ordinary differential equations, but there's been many, many developments where people do much more complicated things or stochastic models and so forth. But I'm not gonna go through this because you all understand it, it's just capturing the cartoon into equations. And now I have treatment, I can put the treatment on, and basically what I say is that treatment, for instance, the reverse transcriptase inhibitor, reduces the infection rate. And by the way, this is very, very akin to these SI um, models that we've been talking a lot about. Um, it's at a different scale, and there's slight differences, but it's the same idea. The only thing that I think it's important to notice here is that we have to deal with the biology and how things work. And so 
the protease inhibitor prevents infectious virus from being produced. So if it's completely efficient, this epsilon would be one, and you have no production of infectious virus. If it's only you know, 90% efficient or 95% efficient is 0.9 or 0.95. The rest is as non-infectious virus. And why is this important? Because when you measure the virus, as I say, we measure the number of genomes. We don't know if they're infectious or not infectious. So this is the observable, is the sum of these two things. But what's contributing to the dynamics is only the infectious. So you need to separate it, but you need to keep track of everything. So that's something which is specific for this treatment in this and, and they have solutions, and the way we do it is to simplify it even more. You know, this was just slight, there's a non-linearity here which makes it actually impossible to solve it analytically, but so we sort that out by just making it linear, and we do that by saying that the target cells, in the time scale of about a month, which we're going to analyze, do not change uh, very much, because the production of normal cells and so forth takes longer. And so we linearize that, now it's solvable. We assume steady state before the start of therapy, which is probably an okay assumption since I showed you that the virus is at that steady state. We solve, and, the, uh, and now we C we know from the other experiment, V0 we know because we can, you know, it's, it's a steady state. Um, so we have epsilon and delta as our, our main uh, unknown. And we can fit this data to patient. Here again, it's 10 days only, and the average uh, dot there is one bleed and each graph is one patient. And what you can see is that there is this nice decay, which is described by the curve um, with fitted parameters uh, as the line indicates here. So we can take delta, which basically is approximately the, the slope of this initial decay. So now we know delta. Yes? The same delta for all the patients. Is it the same delta for all the patients? Actually, it's very, very similar. Right? So if you do this, the, the variability and that, that's another amazing thing in some sense, but that I think that drug treatment is such a strong uh, perturbation uh, that you're measuring the death rate of, of these cells, and they're very, very similar in all, all the patients. This is about delta equals to one, which is a half-life of about 15 hours. So every 15 hours, half of the infected cells are removed and replenished through years and years that the person uh, is infected. So again, very fast. And in fact, it's so fast that now we can start to build a picture of what this means uh, physiologically. And we know that the viral load is about this, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. It varies by four orders of magnitude at this steady state, as Narendra said, for different individuals. Uh, we know that this C, which is the rate of removal, is 23. That was a concentration that's about the, the bodily fluid of, um, you know, extracellular body fluid of a idealized person. So the daily production is staggering amount of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11 virus, virion particles every day for years and years that have to be cope, that have to be removed from the system by all the mechanisms that the immune system and the body has. In terms of infected cells, it has also been measured um, to be about 30 million per day uh, that, that are infected. This is the delta, so we have about 30 million cells dying in removal. This is a large number, but we have to uh, realize that we have about 10 to the 11 CD4 cells in the body. But every day during this time, somehow this daily destruction cannot be uh, met by equal production, and that's why you have that slow but constant decline of CD4 cells that was like that <laughs> in the figure, uh, which eventually leads to AIDS. Okay, and what is the implication of this massive replication? Well, the mutation rate of the virus has been measured uh, in vitro, 10, 3, 10 to the minus 5 per base per replication. We know the number of, ba of uh, bases, nucleotides, the replication, which we just calculated in the previous slide. And so we have about 9 million mutant mutations at a single base in a single cycle every day. Since you can only have, you know, 9,800 different single point mutants, you're making every single mutant every day 10 to the four times or something. No, you're making the same one. And then, of course, you can also make double mutants, and from a single mutant, you can be in the population if it is rep can replicate, and we talked already about fitness and all those things yesterday, and then you can make double mutants, triple mutants, this makes a huge diversity, which Narendra mentioned, and we have the same figure here. This is the diversity, I'm, you know, this is influenza one year, 
global uh, diversity. And the, this is relevant because we need to get a new, a new influenza vac vaccine every year. And this is the diversity we're trying to deal with. Um, this is the e equivalent di diversity of in, inside a single person after uh, some time. Um, and in fact, diversity, people often say that it's very diverse because it's a virus and virus mutate very quickly. Well, actually the mutation rate of influenza is about the same as, or, or even a little bit higher than HIV. And the mutation, inf, the mutation rate of, of hepatitis C is also approximately the same. There's actually three things that are important for diversity. One is the mutation rate. They are high, but normal for this. Two is how fast they replicate, because you know, this is what's going to give you. And HIV, hepatitis C replicate really fast. They have many, many rounds of replication. And the third thing, which I think many, often we forget, is how long the infection lasts. Influenza lasts three to seven days or eight days. So you cannot build a lot of diversity in that time. This lasts years, so you're building diversity all the time. Okay, so everything was fine. The conclusion, one conclusion for this was, well, people go on this decline. If we just project the decline again, all the way down until we have less than one virus in the body, the person is cured. How long does that take? About three years. Unfortunately, things were not that simple. And this is a caution about extrapolating outside the domain where you did your uh, calculation, because after a while, the virus slows down, as I had shown before. And now, instead of being about a day, as I said before, it's now 27 days, it's much slower. And after the second phase, there's actually a third phase, which is even slower, and so forth. And this becomes more complicated. The model that I showed you no longer accommodates these other observations. And so there are extensions of this basic model. For instance, you know, that maybe there are viral reservoirs where the drug doesn't reach or something. Maybe there are some immune system effects or uh, long-lived cells. So other types of cells that don't die as fast. And this was a favored solution, let's say, for this problem because we know that in addition to CD4 T cells, macrophages also get infected. And these are longer lived, at least in vitro, even when they're infected. And so they've made a good uh, potential source for this uh, phase of virus. And still, you know, within this framework, all looked more or less okay. We had hundreds of patients that had been studied and that had followed this uh, pattern of decline. And with this delta that was very similar, actually it turns out that delta only depend, de depend more on the potency of the drug regimen that was being used than from person to person. Uh, but everything was more or less okay. Until in 2007, where a new drug, type of drug, came uh, into a clinical study, and this is an integrase inhibitor. So it's a, a, a drug that prevents the enzyme of the virus that catalyzes the integration into the host DNA. So you're preventing this integration. And what we saw is, again, for a physician, it's the same thing. Well, it goes down, and then after a while it goes down slower. Somehow it goes down faster initially, and then it goes below the detection limit here earlier, but it turns out that in the long term, from the clinical perspective, these types of drugs work the same way. They're not big difference. But for us, people who had been doing modeling of the virus for a long time, this was very strange. Why is it almost like a log difference in this first phase that's going to decay, and then we start? I mean, there, in the model that we have, there is nothing that would allow this. So there were many uh, discussions of this problem in the literature with different types of solution, all based in this original data uh, that I uh, showed there, which was an analysis of the, uh, the pharmaceutical company's clinical trial where they had given this integrase inhibitor for a week singly as a monotherapy, and then they had switched everybody to a combination treatment because it's not ethical to give, in my perspective, not even for a week, but FDA required it, uh, to give one drug to only to an individual for any extended period of time, because what you're going to do is create resistance to that drug. And that in HIV has memory, because it has disintegration, so this resistance will be there. And possibly, you eliminate this drug class from the person's uh, arsenal to, to fight in, in the future. Anyway, so this is not very clean data, because you have only eight days, and then you switch to a different regimen, and you're inferring this you know, two-month decline on this mixture. So we, we tried to look at this also, and we just complicated our model that little bit that was necessary to come to, because we had new data and new drug. And what was that little bit? Is that now we have here reverse transcription, 
this cell is infected in the sense that there's a virus there that has become DNA, the RNA has become DNA, and then we have this integration step when the cell actually is really infected and capable of producing virus. So we had this extra stage here. Um, you know, this would be like susceptible, exposed, infectious, for instance. Um, and we have two extra parameters. These cells might die at some rate, and K is the integration rate. And so we want to know, does this work? And uh, when you have integrase inhibitor, we are blocking that step now. And yes, it works. We use the same uh, data from the clinical um, uh, trials, which is just eight days, but we only looked at eight days. And we see that the model, this is slightly biphasic. We cannot really see in all of these, but if you do a statistical test of a model without this I1 uh, class of cells, which gives us the biphasic decline, because now we have delta here and you have delta one there, so this gives you the bi biphasic decline. If you, if you compare the two models statistically, uh, this model was, uh, was better. But this was not enough, and it was not very easy to pinpoint uh, all the parameters. In particular, K, which is the integration rate, and delta one, which is the loss rate of I1, they are the trade-off in some sense, because they both are contributing to the disappearance of I1 cells. And, and so we had to somehow try to disentangle this. And from in vitro data, it, this data at least showed that the time from reverse transcription to integration, so the time that it, it takes for A1 to disappear, is about nine hours. This is in vitro data. And another very elegant and smart study, I think, from John Murray, uh, they looked at people treated with different classes of drugs and how the decay was, and then they compared this the, the time it took until this decay started, and they came out to the conclusion you know, that these are the differences between integration, reverse transcription with different types of drug, fusion, export, as I said, there's drugs for all these processes, and this red line here is about 10 hours between integration and reverse transcription. There's a, integration is very well defined, look, there's just that little line there, whereas um, reverse transcription, there's a, a wide uh, range there. But still, this was about nine, 10 hours, so what we did is we fitted the data, fixing this integration rate K at different values. And what you can see is that if you do it at different values, delta one, as I said, trades off, so lower K, slightly larger delta one, but delta two doesn't change at all, again, uh, and, and also the, the, the effectiveness of the drug, of, Raltec, of the integrase inhibitor, didn't change. You can say these are very, very potent drugs. This is, so the effect of the drug is one minus omega. That's how much it's reducing K. And omega is 0 0.995, 0 0.997. So this is very potent. And this is true for all drugs. As a, a virologist, a well-known virologist said, I mean, you only have a drug on, on the market if this is true. So that's, it's not surprising that you have very potent drugs, because all the ones that are not potent never got to, to, to the market. They were abandoned before. OK. But this is a very, as I said, small data set for just monotherapy eight days. We really wanted to compare head to head, some, let's say, a regimen that has an integrase inhibitor with one that do not have. Um, so we got three different data sets, either a combination treatment, very strong treatment without uh, this integrase inhibitor. And look, these people are measured every six hours for 72 hours and every day for 10 days and then weekly for 28 days. So it, there's a lot of data and, this, and, and the people, the volunteers are bled very frequently to measure the, the, the concentration of the virus. Then we had that original data and then a, a new data set of combination of this integrase inhibitor with some reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We cannot have just integrase inhibitor therapy, because that's a monotherapy type uh, treatment, and that's no longer it. So anyway, we have 47 HIV infected people, 613 viral loads, and we use the mixed effects model approach that was also briefly mentioned uh, yesterday to fit the data. The first thing we checked is to see, is there a difference be between this, this difference that was seen between a decay with integrase inhibitor and without integrase inhibitor? And yes, there is. In blue are the patients treated without an integrase inhibitor, and in pink are the patients treated with the integrase inhibitor. And even though there is some noise here, you can see that this goes on for longer. This is the median uh, in black. And the start of the second phase, so we have this first phase, and then the slower second phase, there is this difference delta, which is almost one log, which is 
basically says with a completely different data set, completely different, the same thing that they had uh, mentioned in this 2007 paper. Okay, good. So we can fit our data. And this is the same model I showed you before, but this only accounts for the first phase, as I said. This, once we start the second phase, we need another source, these other long liver cells. And what we do is we have this model, we just replicate it exactly, but we say that these other, these other cells here, maybe they're macrophages, we don't know. They, are, they produce virus, they are slower. And because they are slower, they give rise to this second phase. And again, integrase inhibitor can uh, inhibit this step here and this step here, and reverse transcriptase inhibitors can inhibit this step and step, because the biology of the virus is the same, it's just that um, these cells are, are longer lived. Okay, so we did that. We can write equations for this model. Again, it's quite simple. There's just that sm same nonlinearity of the virus in the target cells, which we linearize by assuming the target cells are approximately constant. In addition, we can do some tricks <laughs> by, uh, without lo loss of generality, uh, rescaling some variables. We can show that, in fact, P times I comes always together, and so it cannot really be distinguished, so we replace that by a new I. Um, and then we do also another thing, which is a quasi steady state. C is 23, so viral removal is very fast. So virus basically is tracking whatever the infected cells do. If infected cells produce more, you get more virus. If infected cells produce less, we have less virus. But uh, it's in a, such a, a much faster time scale, the viral dynamics. So we can use a quasi-steady state approximation for that as well. And with those two, we reduce uh, these two uh, things. We reduce the previous set of equations to these four, which are linear, so we can solve it. We can have some analytical insight of what's going on and why uh, things are different. And it's also much easier to fit because there's uh, less things. So as I said, we used nonlinear mixed effects models, which is a population-based data fitting, where we have a biological model, we have an error model, and we have some variability in the model. So more specifically, you know, this is our data, um, and we are fitting the logs of it. The biological model is the solution of the uh, differential equations that I showed you. Um, this is our error model. We say that the errors are additive in the logs um, with some variance uh, that we have to estimate as part of the estimation procedure. And then our parameters, the, the C, that, well, the C is fixed because we know that, but the deltas and the epsilons and so forth may vary from person to person. This is the random term, which is the variability from person to person, and that, and that again is assumed to be normal with some covariance matrix that has to be estimated. And that we typically constrain so we don't have, you know, a N by N, where N is the number of parameters matrix that might be too difficult to, to estimate. So what basically what all this means is we get all the, four, the 47 patients, the uh, whatever many hundreds of viral loads we had, and we fit everything at the same time. All the parameters that we think should be the same are the same. So we think that the biology doesn't change and so because of the different drug treatments. So the deltas don't change, the Cs don't change, um, the integration rate K doesn't change. What changes, the, what, the only thing that changes is the treatment. So in some, uh, uh, in some cases, we have uh, integrase inhibitor, so we need an omega that reduces K. In other cases, we have a protease inhibitor, so we need an epsilon, which reduces the maturation of the virus, as I showed you. And that is uh, here in, this, in the covariate uh, uh, of the model, and that changes. But then we have all these other data to estimate uh, the, the parameters. And so we can fit the, 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 the data, and it works in some sense. This, I had 47 patients here, just a, a seven shown from the people treated without an integrase inhibitor and people treated with an integrase inhibitor. And what you can, what, what is actually going on here is that these ones have this first phase and then a second phase because we cannot see the delta one from the, the, the I1 cells. Okay. Everyone still knows what I1 cells are or they're lost. So these cells that are, have reverse transcribed but not integrated yet. Because I'm not blocking this step, I don't have an integrase inhibitor, this is occurring seamlessly and I it cannot really, uh, it's not being perturbed, so I cannot see it in my experiment. Here actually, I have a fast phase, then a slightly slower phase, and only then I get to the second phase. And these are the different uh, 
decays of the different cells. Um, these are more fits, just to show you that you know, this works across all the patients, basically. And then this is what's called the, the, the overall result. So if I look at the best parameters for each case, this is what I see. And it's basically what I said before. I have, I always wanted to use this. Because <laughs> okay, this shakes too much. Okay, anyway, so the blue one is the, is the, the treatment without an integrase inhibitor. And it has a first phase, and then after here it was six days or so, goes into the second phase decline. And this is the very well-known dec uh, decay that we had seen before, and has been very well documented. Uh, in, when we have combination of these reverse transcriptase inhibitors with an integrase inhibitor, this first phase continues for longer. It slows down slightly, and this is phase 1b. And phase 2 only starts much later here about... And then because it's, it starts later, it starts at a lower level. It's not that it's faster initially, it's actually the same, because it's the same parameter, is the death rate of infected cells. Uh, but it starts later, and so we have this difference. And we could calculate exactly what is this difference, and, and that this would, act, if you look here, there's an exponential there, so it actually is narrowing down. And if it continued like this, and we could see it, it would, they would come together. And we even know what is the difference here, is actually the potency of the integrase inhibitor. And you could ask, but how do you know it's phase two or not? Because we know that phase two is the decline of cells, of these long-lived cells, the M cells in my diagram. So I can very easily in my model see when is the decline, when are the M cells dominating because all the I cells have gone away. And when you do that, you can, that's the start of phase two. And if you project this back, this is how many of these M cells we have at the start of phase two. Okay, so this is what the, the model gave us, the graphics. But the real surprise came when we looked at the statistics of, of, of the model. So this is our initial model. We had to try to estimate uh, these parameters. And, um, and as I said, some of these trade-offs, so we had to do a lot of different simulations to make sure that uh, we were not falling into some kind of local attractor for the fitting, but no matter what we did, no matter what was the variability from the different uh, uh, fits, one thing always came, uh, it was always true. This delta M2 was equal to that delta 2. That is, the decay rate of these supposedly long-lived cells was the same as the decay rate of those supposedly short-lived cells, which didn't make much sense initially, um, or, but it does simplify the model because you know, from a mathematical perspective, the only difference between these two cells is that they have a different uh, decay rate. If they don't have a different decay rate from the statistics, then they're not different cells, they are the same. So, so the, mo the fitting is telling us that this is the right model. It's a model where we have these cells, um, and what happens, it, at least now that we can look at them all, inter interpret what is going on, what happens is that this integration rate here is very fast. And this integration right here is very slow. But once this integration is completed, production of virus and loss of these cells progresses at the same rate. So the difference between those two uh, declines is that uh, this, this cycle here progresses very fast. This cycle here takes some time where the cells are in this M1 class before they become I2, and then they and biologically, this is plausible. It could even be that these cells are the same, both CD4 T cells, but these are activated cells, for instance, which we know are much better at replicating the virus. They have larger pools of nucleotides, they have their chromatin open, they have uh, you know, energy uh, uh, me metabolism going on, so it's very much easier. And these could be cells that are resting. Once, at some point, they get activated for some reason, um, because they encounter the antigen or they encounter a pro-inflammatory environment or something, they might get activated, then they would progress to integration, and then, but once they're here, they're, now they're both activated, and so they just produce virus at the same rate and they die at, at the same rate. And we could look at the, so this is an even simpler model that this, uh, is selling us, because now we only have one class of, producing, of viral producing cells, 
Uh, these are the estimated parameters, and essentially, we have this slow, rapid infection model, and if you don't have an integrase inhibitor, we are in the situation that we had before. We have delta-2, which is estimated at the same level as before, and we can measure the second phase, which is the decline plus the integration of these fast, uh, oh, sorry, of these slow cells, as this. In the case when you have integrase inhibitor, we can actually um, basically um, uh, unfold or uh, untangle this, this initial phase. We still have the same delta-2. That's a very fast initial first phase. Then we have the integration in the fast cells, this thing here, which we are blocking so we can see this delta-1. And then we have the same as here, except that we are blocking this slow integration rate. So we have one framework, one model, that explains disparate data sets that could not be done before. So implications, HIV is sustained by short-lived infected cells because they have fast integration and short production time, and long-lived infected cells because they have slow integration, even though they still have fast production once integration occurs. Now, these long-lived cells are only about 4% of productive infections. Most cells go through the top cycle infection. Most infections occur that way, and fewer through this slow cell. It makes sense because if these are resting cells or non-activated cells, it's much harder to infect them. But because they live longer, they actually represent about 40% of the total infected cells. That's what the model is saying. The one big problem, quote unquote, is that we estimate that short-lived cells integration is about seven hours, which is kind of in the same ballpark of that nine to 10 hours that we had seen before. In the long-lived cells, it's six weeks. Talk to many virologists, and they say, you know, this is impossible because the biology, the pre-integration complex cannot stay there. And, but unfortunately, or fortunately, if you read the literature, there's many, 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 many papers that show that integration can take a very long time, that there's many reservoirs pre-integration where the viral genome, for instance, can circularize and be very stable and then eventually unwind again and integrate. So I think this is possible. We don't know. You know we still need some experiment, more experimental things of this. And what I like is, as a modeler is that we provide one model that parsimonious explains data sets that are disparate and that we couldn't really understand with the model that we had uh, previously. So I'll just thank everyone that was involved, all the people that gave us the data, including the company that, that um, did the, the initial clinical trials, the people I work with at, at Los Alamos, and the funders, both in the US and now in, in Portugal. And if we have just one second, I'll try to see if I can get this to run. So what we have here is those three populations of cells, the, the, fast, the, the cells before integration, but they're going to integrate, integrate fast, the cells before integration that are going to integrate slow, and the infect, productively infected cells that produce virus, when you're treated with an integrase inhibitor or not. And oh, and it didn't work. And now we see, once you start treatment, these different compartments are going down. When, when this compartment is making a, a, a bigger co uh, contribution than this, you start the second phase, and now we, we see that. But this one, because this is emptying slower, it takes longer for this to be more con a bigger contribution than that, and it's only now that you start the second phase. So there is this kind of paradox, which is, even though we're giving more treatment, bad, which should be possibly better treatment, it takes longer to get rid of these uh, cells. And, and, and that's why you can see the first phase going on for longer, because it takes uh, more time uh, until this, the decay of this compartment masks the, the decay of that compartment. OK, so thank you. And oh, I still have 45 minutes, so <laughs> uh, I'll take any questions if there are any.